And joining us now is Kevin Smith. How are you? Good morning, kids. How are you? Good morning. So you have a lot of great things behind you. Are those toys? What do you have behind you? It's a bookshelf full of like, uh, you know, the, the books that I've been collecting since I was a kid. Uh, on, over on this side, you've got that side. Scripts, <laughs> like all the scripts that I wrote. And then there's a bunch of like trinkets and toys that I've had, you know, since I was a kid. I, I really can't throw anything out. If uh, Clerks hadn't worked out, Porters would have been the perfect show for me. You know what? Good thing 1994 came by and it was a good year for you. Very it good was. Year. 1994, absolutely the best year for me. What did you write before Clerks? Was Clerks your first thing you ever tried to write? or? Yeah, really? Clerks was the first thing. I, technically, I, I wrote Dogma, the script for Dogma, before Clerks, but I didn't take it out or try to make it or anything like that. Um, but Clerks is the first thing I, I wrote and then tried to make. You know, we got very fortunate. Um, first time out. You know, the movie looks like it was made by a bunch of amateurs and i think that's what always worked for it was people were like oh look at these kids putting it together on their own good for them you know and also it's it's about working which is something we all do so even if you've never worked in a convenience store you've had a job that you hated or many jobs that you've hated where you spent a lot of time just like hanging out and talking to the people on the job rather than actually doing what you were paid for so i think that's why that movie connected in a big bad way um people hate work all over the world man now the backstory did you write that afterwards like how the how they met his infants and things like that the main characters um i mean over the years ever since clerks like i've kept I'm building on to uh, clerks we've made two sequels uh that are direct sequels clerks two and clerks three and then a bunch of the movies I made in the beginning were all connected anyway. So Mallrats, Chasing Amy, Dogma, Jane, Silent Bob, Shark Back, they were all connected to Clerks uh, um, and, and Clerks 2 and Clerks 3. So the most recent one, two we did, we did Jane, Silent Bob reboot back in 2019. And then we did uh, Clerks 3 back in 2022, I think it was, was when it came out. So I've continued to build, even in comics, like I've got a comic book label with uh, Dark Horse called Secret Stash Press. And I've done a bunch of comics like about the various characters and what we call the Viewsk universe, the place where all of my movies have been set. But thank the Lord for that convenience store job. I'd worked in convenience stores for like a long time, but that last one, uh, Quick Stop, that had enough freedom, you know, and, and mobility where I could, I, I came to my bosses, like, can I shoot a, a film here? And they were, you know, I think they thought we'd be running around with a VHS camera or something like that. They didn't know how involved it would be, but thanks to the, uh, to the toppers uh, who own Quick Step, I was able to make that flick and it changed my life. Speaking of changing lives, you're very loyal. You stayed in touch with Ben Affleck, and you've got Jennifer, and you got Jay. You have all the same ensemble cast. Your daughter Harley. You put in another project. I love that. Mm. So do you guys like yeah. travel together when you're not working together, or how did you assemble that circle of trust around yourself? I think like we all worked together so early in our careers. Like in the case of Ben and and Matt, Jason Lee, folks like that. Like um, you know, I worked with those cats second time out the gate like on mall rats and so you know mall rats tanked even though people love it now it moved and do well at the box office but chasing amy was the one we did right after that and me and and jason lee and ben affleck and joey adams i felt like we had a lot to prove and so we went all in on that movie doing our best and that really like made all the difference clerks introduced me um, to the scene and and uh, established me mall rats destroyed my career and then chasing amy uh, <laughs> well there but always needs to be one with thing with in our friends, careers right but being with friends like having working with people you know over and over again like to me just made sense there's a shorthand for how you could communicate, um, you know what they could do, they know what you could do. And it doesn't mean I'm, I'm against like working with new people. I've worked with new people across my entire career, but I love the people I've worked with, the familiar and, and, and like keeping it like an acting troupe. So, you know, but believe me, Ben doesn't need uh, to reach out to me to be like, come be in one of my things, but I'm always reaching out to him to be like, don't we want to be in another thing? He was the last thing he did was Clerks 3. With us. But he loves you because of Goodwill Hunting. Like, I think the story goes, if it's accurate, that you were both like auditioning for something and that's how you met? 
That's Ben and Ben and Matt have been friends forever. Ben, how I met Ben was Ben auditioned for Mallrats. He walked into okay. Mallrats, and it was the day after or the day of a Hollywood, Hollywood Reporter or Variety had run articles about how Ben and Matt had written a script called Goodwill Hunting, and they sold it to Castle Rock. So when Ben came in for the Mallrats audition, I was like, what are you doing here? I just read that you sold the script for like 800,000 <laughs> bucks. You know, this movie pays nothing. And he's like, how'd you know that? And I was like, I read the things and stuff. So uh, we were all kind of, you know, uh, uh, unknowns in the beginning. I, I was more well-known because of Clerks, like because that had been a year of, of uh, folks saying nice things about the movie. So when we hit mall rats and I met Ben, we became friends at the end of the process. He was talking about that script he had written, which we all knew about like Goodwill hunting. And he was like, castle rocks, not making it. They're giving us uh, like a window to take it out uh, two months. And if we can sell it great, if not, it goes back to them and we're not attached anymore. Um, so they were like, you know, you work at Miramax. Can you get it over there? And me and Scott Mosier, my producer, we both read it. And we loved it. We brought it into Miramax and mercifully they bought it. So they made us uh, co-executive, co-executive producers on the movie or something like that. Um, you, you know, and, and oddly enough, like by accident, I'm, I was attached to an Oscar winner. <laughs> by accident. You know what's so cool, too, is that you are diverse. You also work with like superhero stuff. You do a lot of different things. So tell us. I guess for me, like, a, did you have a favorite toy as a child or something that just kind of sparked your creativity and made you go in that direction? You know, when I was a kid, I, I was born in 1970. So when Star Wars came out, I was the right age and it was in the sweet spot. So, uh, you know, I was a big Star Wars figures kid. We were a, kind of not a wealthy family, so I didn't have the full collection, but the ones I did, I, I cherished. And, you know, when you're playing, you know, back in the day, you can see Star Wars um, like once. Um, and then maybe if you were lucky, your parents took you to see it again, like next month or something like that. But it wasn't this like aching familiarity with the movie. So when you were playing with the action figures, you had to be creative. You know, you, you could do the movie over and over again, but you could also just go off on other adventures. And I think that had a lot to do with like why I became a writer. Um, I've always liked writing and stuff, but also the idea of like, when you're a writer, you're never bored um, or alone. You know, you can sit down at, at, at a typewriter or keyboard and invent an entire world, an entire mythology, an entire storyline. So, you know, writing has been made all the difference uh, in my life. I had a fifth grade teacher, Miss Catanza Wright, who encouraged me to like write a book when I was a kid to enter this Avon Young young novelist contest and i didn't win or anything but she was like you you, you know your your vocabulary is pretty big and she's wow. going and you're good with a chunk of phrase you should you should write and it kind of molded my life are you still writing and if so do you do yeah. it like on a yellow pad or how do you get your ideas from here to there um i do it on a laptop uh, ever since uh, i think in 1990 we were going to Sundance Tokyo and I was writing mall rats and so I bought my first like uh, Macintosh laptop so uh, I've been a, a, a laptop writer for for years now um, and uh, it's you know I've got I'm looking at four separate laptops on the desk one's for writing wow. one's for working, one's for old stuff uh, and one's just for you know staying current so it's I, I, I take my writing pretty seriously now that doesn't mean it's good a lot of people have told me over the years you suck but people will tell you that you know over time particularly in this very uh oversharing world of social media that we live in there was a time where somebody had to come up to you and say something insulting now they could say it you know from distance and stuff so i i you know for as many people are like hey you're great at what you do i've got almost an equal amount of people who are like you suck at what you do and they like to remind me every day but to be fair I've been in this job 30 years and wow. for 30 years, there's always been somebody telling me that I'm not good at the job. So it just kind of comes with the job. Do you enjoy that though? Do you enjoy the, the hecklers? Do they like inspire you a little bit? Like, oh yeah, Pfft, whatever. No, yeah. Not at all. I'm a, a very insecure, um, you know, a, a former fat kid, you know, raised very chubby and whatnot. So everything 
is it hurts me and, is, and I'm sensitive and everything breaks my heart. So yeah, I, when people don't like the movies, it's not very easy for me to be like, well, you know, that's just their opinion. That's the movie. The movie is me and, 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 you know, I, I am it. So it's like, it's, we're intertwined. I don't really make films that are um, kind of disconnected from me. So in many ways over the years, when people like kind of said stuff about the movies, it felt akin to them saying stuff about me, but 30 years into the job, you can kind of separate those two things. It doesn't make it any easier when somebody's like, wow. this sucks, or you're not good at what you do. I know I, I did one of the on-camera Kevin for a long time because I thought my nose was too big and I didn't like the space between my teeth because somebody had made fun of me. And that when I was 12 and it lived in here for the longest time. So thank you for sharing that. That's kind of cool that you opened up to me about that. What's oh, happening now is you're going to be doing like you're on the road. And, it, yeah, and, part and you of say that the characters are old, but I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Part of the part of the job over the years has always been like me going out and standing on a stage and talking. Uh, it, actually, one of my favorite parts of the job. The uh, you know it's it's this point in my career I, I make more money standing on a stage talking about directing films than I do actually directing films. So uh, being able to story tell in a different arena, not just like let me get a bunch of money together and make a fake movie. Uh, being able to just get up on stage and extemporaneously kind of talk uh, and story tell has been a boon and something I've done as a side hustle uh, throughout the 30 years of my career almost. And at a certain point, about 10 years into it, I started bringing Jay with me where I was like, hey, man, let's let, we can sit down and do a show. And it really was started as an intervention podcast because he was like knee deep in the drugs and whatnot. And so wow. I was like, let's do a, a show because I'd been doing podcasts since like 2007. And he was really interested in doing one. And I said, OK, what we do is um, we do a show about you and booze and drugs, about like your lifelong struggle and whatnot. And that keeps you clean because that way everybody who ever meets you on the street, listens to the show, they'll be like, you staying clean. So you'll have a bunch of sponsors across the world. So we started the show, Jane, Sal, and Bob Get Old, over 10 years ago. I think right now we're in our 13th year um, for that purpose, to kind of keep him clean. Now he don't need it. He's got two kids that keep him clean. Um, he's the father of, of a nine-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son. So that's who he stays clean for now. But in the beginning, it was the, the big difference between like Jason falling back down on the path or kind of moving forward. So the, the show has been, you know, immense uh, for for us, um, uh, the fans seem to love it over the years. But more importantly, like it it keeps Jason or started keeping Jason on the straight and narrow. Um, so it, and it's, for you, it's too, Kevin. For you too, because you had the big health challenge, almost died on everybody. Does it help you stay <laughs> on track in terms of eating healthy, like eating baked garbanzo beans or whatever your go to treat is? It, it, my 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 uh, go to treat lately has been uh, pinto beans like crazy um oh, i you know what it does <laughs> being on stage or being someplace where you're actually going to be seen like oddly enough does help you kind of uh stay in, in shape to some degree um because i'm like oh i'm gonna be on stage in a week like i'm not gonna eat that cake i don't need it because i'm gonna be on stage in a week so it has that benefit to it um, but, you know, the whole time we were doing Jay and Silent Bob get old, it was always primarily focused on on Jason and his addictions. But then after my heart attack, we had to address the fact that I was like, well, a sugar addiction is, you know, what got me there, putting on all that weight and eating all that terrible food and stuff. And we marked it as ironic that for years I'd sit there and be like, stop putting that poison in your body while I was eating garbage that led to a heart attack. So, you know, <laughs> it's I thought I was helping him. He was helping. Well, I know all your fans are going to be showing out in droves. I know you've got a show in New Jersey. You've got a show here in Long Island in Paramount. Um, so congrats on that. What can people anticipate seeing you do with them? Uh, so when we do Jane, Silent Bob, Get Old, um, it's like watching two friends uh, sit down and, and chat with one another uh, and, and try to make each other laugh. It's a very funny show. Um, we're going to read a scene from the upcoming uh, Jane Silent Bob movie. We make another Jane Silent Bob flick at the end of the year. So um, we like when we do the live shows before we shoot a flick, we've got 
the script that nobody's ever seen. So we start doing pieces of it because we get to test it out on the road, see if it's funny. And whatnot. So we'll be doing that. Uh, and then we always wind up the, the show with a very physical game um, called the, uh, well, I don't think I could say the name uh, on TV, but uh, essentially. <laughs> blankety, uh, beep, beep, blankety blank blank. Yeah. It is let us, and then there's a word. Um, and, and it's, we bring up people on stage and they mime ridiculous, like, sex positions with Jason. It's kind of kind of funny. We had to stop doing it during COVID because, you know, COVID. But now that COVID seems to be in the rear view, um, we're back to bringing people up on stage and having them have make pretend sex with Jason. It sounds like a lot of fun. We could do, like, it's pretend sex right now. I don't know, like... Little bunny foo foo. I don't know if that works for you, but Absolutely. nothing hotter than little bunny foo foo. <laughs> nothing hotter. <laughs> oh my gosh, I enjoyed you so much. When you're doing this new film, when you're getting ready to do that, what needs to go in place? Do you have like the same investors and things like that? Is it like just green light from the get go, or is it just as hard what to kind of get it to go? What a great question. Um, sometimes you do have the same investors. This time we won't. There was another okay. company that kind of approached us and be like, hey, would you like to do a thing? So uh, this time around, it's for, for those cats. But like, for example, I finished a movie last summer. Uh, we made a flick called The 430 Movie, and we shot it at my movie theater. I own a movie theater in New Jersey um, called Smog Castle Cinemas. It's a five-screen multiplex, and the movie theater I used to go to when I was a kid growing up and whatnot. So I bought it with my friends. And and um, once we bought it, I was like, oh, my God, I have a whole set to make a movie on, a free set at that. And so I wrote this flick called The 430 Movie. Um, we shot it last summer. It comes out this summer. I believe it comes out in August. I'll take it out on a mini tour ahead of time and whatnot. So that movie was made with a company called Saban. Saban had also made Jay and Silent Bob reboot a couple of years ago. So, yeah, sometimes you work with the same cats again. This time around for the new Jane Silent Bob movie uh, is going to be a different company. So, you know, the first thing you need, of course, is a script and a cast and then money becomes important. Um, but this company that kind of sought me out, they were already kind of like, look, we got money. We want to make a movie. So it, wow, it, that's that exciting part that they the came to you with that. By the way, that was very inspirational. I read about that. And I guess it's common knowledge that you bought that theater. But good for you. You know? Yeah. Oh, it's it's been so fun. And like, you know, it's an over 100 years. The building itself is like 105 years old. The movie theater is about 102 years old or something. So, you know, letting it shut down it just didn't seem like an option. Um, you know, and mercifully, uh, my friends and I were able to cobble together enough loot to, to kind of keep her open. Now we've turned it into a nonprofit theater so we can kind of keep it healthy for years after we're gone as well. How can people donate to that? Is that like a nonprofit that somebody could like help you keep it open? Yeah, the Smodcastle Foundation. Okay. If you go to smodcastlecinemas.com, there should be something about it. We applied, um, what was it, a month and a half ago, two months ago for our tax exempt status. And we got our number. And so we're in the process of pushing everything over into, into a nonprofit business. Lovely. If there's any a red carpet event or something like that or a way that my media can help you, I'd be happy to do that because I really love helping support nonprofit organizations. And I loved oh, our visit well. today. We really had a good time with you. I as, well, I as well. I enjoyed it too. Thanks for making the time. You're welcome. Happy journeys to you, Kevin Smith. Happy journeys to you. Such a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. You as well. Take care. Bye-bye.